Welcome. We hope you are having a wonderful Independence Day on this 4th of July. You are watching Awake in Las Vegas, and we want to invite you to attend one of our services on Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. or on Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. If you'd like to connect with us, please visit our website, awakenlv.org, and plan your visit today. We are a community of Jesus followers who worship our God, grow as disciples, and reach Las Vegas and the world with the gospel. As we celebrate being one nation under God, let's worship together.
is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might 
forever and ever. God, we thank you because you reign forevermore. And so as we worship God through giving, may we hold on, may we grasp this concept that Christ is seated on the throne, that he reigns forevermore. And that as we give, we are worshiping him, we are trusting our God who is faithful. So God, here we are, we pray that you would be glorified in all that we give. And God, use it for your kingdom, use it for your glory. We love you, God, and it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray, amen. Let's sing one more time, holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord, holy is the Lord Almighty, seated on the throne, seated on the throne of glory, high and lifted up, your presence fills the temple when we worship you. Oh, we worship you. Holy. holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord Almighty. Seated on the throne. Seated on the throne of glory. High and lifted up. Your presence fills the temple when we worship you. Hey, well, happy birthday to the United States of America as we celebrate 248 years today. We have for sure come a long way from the founding of our country, 1607, the first settlement in Jamestown, to the expansion of 13 colonies, to the official founding of our nation on July 4th, 1776, where the Continental Congress adopted and issued the Declaration of Independence severing their political connections to Great Britain, and then summarizing as well the colonists' motivation to seek independence as they committed themselves to the protection of God's divine providence. And of course, you know from that point, we've had extraordinary progress from the formation of our new nation to the expansion westward, to the Civil War and Reconstruction, industrialization, the Great War, the Great Depression, World War II, the Civil Rights Movement during the Cold War, to contemporary history. Uh, we have seen in our nation extraordinary progress. And during that time, the religious landscape of our country has shifted tremendously. From predominantly Protestant roots, there's been the pretty much consistent rise and fall, ebb and flow of our collective drawing near to God and turning away from Him. And during those hundreds of years, there's been a series of great awakenings. When I say great awakening, I'm talking about a special outpouring of God's Holy Spirit that moves in a significant way in our country, collectively touching not just tens of thousands, but even hundreds of thousands of people. And then, and then affecting our culture and our society, individuals such as Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, Charles Finney and Dwight L. Moody, William Seymour, God raised up these individuals over the course of the history of our nation to touch us, to draw us back to him, when we were in moments wayward from him. I do believe that as we consider the great exponential growth of our nation, as we think about the goodness and the greatness of God providentially caring for us, as we consider times of real social and cultural calamity that in the past had drawn us back to our faith in God, I believe that we're at that crossroads once again. And I think there are two things in particular today that I would consider you to reflect on as we think about where we're at as a nation, as we're considering the crossroads really that we are at, as we consider the ebb and flow, the rise and fall of our collective attention either towards God or away from God. 
I think in particular the rise of the nuns, this surge of religious disaffiliation that seems to be impacting our society today where where scores of people do not deny the importance of spirituality, they just resist the institution of organized religion. I think in addition to that, as we consider the anchoring of secularism in our society today, these two things together, from my point of view at least, really do um, seem to me to be hallmark indicators that our nation is ready once again for a great awakening. I was reading a recent article that said this, the U.S. religious landscape has evolved from predominantly Protestant Christian nation to a more diverse and pluralistic society. Reflecting broader social, cultural, and demographic changes, it went on to say this ongoing transformation Transformation suggests a future where religious diversity and secularism continue to shape American society. And that last phrase in particular really does concern me. Let me just read it again. It said, where religious diversity and secularism continue to shape American society. Now, of course, you know, as you're in the marketplace or amongst your friends, that many people would say that secularism is in fact a good thing for our nation. I just want to remind you that secularism is in the absence of God in society. It is the marketplace of false gods in the absence of a Judeo-Christian God in society. The secular mind desires to have all the benefits of Christianity without Christ. And for me, as I consider that for our nation, this definitely um, draws my attention once again to our great need for God to pour out His Holy Spirit and collectively touch our nation once again. This secularism oftentimes focuses the worship, focuses people's worship, obviously not on the Judeo-Christian God, but people begin to worship at the altar of human achievement, either in intellectual pursuits or scientific advancement or in the arts or in finance. And in the midst of all of that, the declaration of God rings clear from Psalm 33 verse 10. Where the Bible says this, the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. It goes on to say the counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Now check this out. The Bible says in Psalm 33, 10, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. Now I read that to you today in the context of celebrating the 248th birthday of our nation. And I say to you today that that message of scripture rings clear to our nation just as it did so many years ago when it was written by the psalmist. But the argument that you may say to me is is something like this. Well, you know, that promise was the promise of God to the nation of Israel. And, and, And I would say, you know what, that's true. That is true. That promise of God for sure was in particular to a nation that he had chosen, that he had selected. And by the way, can I say to you that that promise that God gave to the Israelites so many thousands of years ago, it remains true for them today. But I would also argue that that promise we find in scripture is in fact a truism. It is a law of nature. It is God saying that In reality, any nation that chooses to seek him and to serve him will be blessed. That it is in fact the desire of God to bless peoples, societies, and cultures. And I think that this is the testimony of scripture. I believe that this is something we can know as Christians. I also believe that our adversary, Satan, knows this is true as well. This is why he works overtime to develop political philosophies like communism, which are intentionally designed to eradicate specifically the Judeo-Christian belief in God and the institution of his people, the church. And we see that today uh, in Europe as Russia specifically seeks to systematically destroy evangelical churches in the Ukraine. But I also believe as we look at the scripture and we consider this desire of God, this rich desire of God to bless societies and and cultures and peoples, we see this exemplified in a nation other than the nation of Israel. We see it exemplified among the people of Nineveh. You remember that country. It was a wicked, wayward city 
um, responsible for the altogether exploitation of the northern kingdom of Israel. In fact, responsible for their overthrow. And if you remember the story of Jonah, then you recall that God raised up a reluctant prophet who absolutely knew 100% that God was so merciful that his desire was to show mercy on societies and cultures and peoples outside of the nation of Israel. That as that calling of God came to Jonah himself, he fled in the other direction because he knew this to be the very character of God. And yet ultimately, as we know how the story goes, he preached for three days in the city of Nineveh from one side to the other. There was a mighty work that God did among those who were disbelieving. As the king of Nineveh himself heard this message, the Bible reminds us that he rose up from his throne, that he tore his own robe. He covered himself in sackcloth and ashes and he proclaimed a fast And he proclaimed that the people of Nineveh wholesale repent. And he said these words. He said, who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. And the scripture goes on to say, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them. And he did not do it. And so I'm saying to you today, as we consider the goodness of God over the course of the nation's history, that we see even in Nineveh an example of the desire of God to bless peoples and societies and cultures. And from this, I would say on this extraordinary day where we celebrate the the divine providence of God and his care for the United States of America, that just like Nineveh of old, America needs to turn to God again. I think one nation under God begins with one American at a time choosing to live with Jesus Christ as the Lord of his or her life. To be under God means that you have turned your life to God. Like Nineveh, choosing to believe the message of the gospel, choosing to turn to God with all of your heart, And then choosing to follow Christ all of the days of your life. Because, you know, as you read the message of the scripture, what you discover is is that there is one overarching story. There is one story that's superior to any national story, and that is the story of God. Specifically, that God has a plan, that God is at work. That from the very fall of humanity, God has been working to redeem humanity and creation to himself, all of that culminating in the person of Jesus Christ, his incarnation, his perfect life, his death on the cross as a substitute for your sin and my sin and his glorious resurrection and ascension to the very right hand of God. It is in the culmination of God's good grace through the giving of his son that you today can discover and maybe even be told for the very first time that God loves you, that there is a God who is able to heal your broken heart, that there is a God who is able to fill your life with with joy, that there is a God who could be present to strengthen you in your weaknesses, to mend your broken relationships, to give you power over your addictions, and to forgive your sins, and to bring to you a brand new beginning in your life. I suggest to you today that all of that is possible simply by putting your trust and faith in the person who loved you so much that he gave his life for you as he suffered on the cross, taking the punishment that you deserve for your sin and that I deserve for my sin so that we could be reconciled to God. In fact, Jesus himself said these words from the prophet Isaiah, these words that applied to him some 600 years after Isaiah had penned them. He said, the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Maybe some of you are today, some of you today are wondering why it is that God sent his only begotten son. Well, according to the words of Christ himself, this was his purpose. He came to bring good news to the poor, to bind up those who are brokenhearted, to give liberty to those who are captives or those who are oppressed, and to release from prison those who are bound. 
In fact, the Bible says in Isaiah 53, verse 5, that Jesus was pierced for our transgressions, that he was crushed for our iniquities, that upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds we can be healed. Today in our country, regardless of how you think things are going socially for us, the fact is this, God is at work. God is at work today in lives all around you. And he is creating for himself a holy nation. Just as Peter said when he penned these words, he, speaking of the followers of Jesus, said, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He said, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. On this special day, as we celebrate the 248th birthday of the United States of America, I want to encourage you, make this the day that you receive the mercies of God through faith in Jesus Christ. I believe in these very dark and challenging times that we live in, that we are ripe for another radical work of God's Holy Spirit, that we are in fact on the precipice of what historians may call the fifth great awakening. As we see social calamity all around us, this moment is composed by God himself for us to cry out to him. Just as the Israelites were burdened under the weight of Pharaoh's oppression in Egypt and they cried out to God and God sent a redeemer and did a mighty work in their lives, so also today, one by one as Americans, as we cry out to God and put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ, we can see a groundswell, we can see a surge of spirituality take root in our country again. And God can take those things that the devil has intended for evil and he can turn them around for good. I suggest to you today, this starts one person at a time. Maybe you've never put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ and I've shared with you all the things that God can do in your life if you would just simply believe. Today, maybe you're one of those people who resist the, the institutions of religion and I would have to say I'm right there with you. Because what we have as Christians is not an institute of religion. We have a relationship with God through faith in his son. And because God loves us, we experience the fullness of God's healing and, the God's, and God's grace and the capacity of God to mend our broken heart and fill us with his joy. The ability to God, of God to forgive us of our sins and lift the guilt and shame that we've been carrying throughout our life and give us a brand new start in him. Would you take that step of faith today? As we celebrate our nation's birthday, would you today have your own spiritual birthday being born again through trust and faith in Jesus Christ? The truth is this, that God has been at work in your life. And this isn't the first time that you've considered these things. In fact, he has been working all around you. He's been speaking to you, intending that all of that work in your life would culminate in this very moment, in this very decision where you would choose to turn your whole heart to him and then to see not only that he will do a great and amazing work in your life, but he will make you a part of his overarching story, this beautiful story of God that extends from the very beginning of time itself and will culminate in the coming of the celestial city, the story in which you are able to be a part of the family of God and to know him forever. As you're watching this, if this is you today, I wanna lead you in a very simple prayer. I wanna lead you in an opportunity to talk to God yourself, to speak to him and say to him that you are choosing to turn with all of your heart to his son and to believe personally that he died on the cross for your sins and that he rose again from the dead. And then to declare that you're choosing to follow him all the days of your life. And as you do that, the Bible says, you will be adopted into the family of God. You will be made the son or the daughter of the living God. And so if this is you today, listen, bow your head with me and close your eyes and follow me in this prayer. Take this step of faith Call out to God and watch him as he has in so many hundreds of thousands of lives over the course of time, 
Watch him do an amazing work in your life. Would you pray with me? And just follow me in this simple prayer today. Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you, God, that you have spoken to me. Thank you that you are real and that you love me. And today I'm choosing. I'm choosing to turn away from my sin. I'm choosing to turn away from my unbelief. I'm choosing to put my trust and faith in Jesus, your son. I believe he died for me, that he rose again, that he has ascended to your right hand. And today I receive him as my Lord and as my Savior. Today I choose to be a follower of Christ. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Hey, if you followed me in that prayer, I want to welcome you into the family of God and As you have prayed, God has heard, and he is going to honor your step of faith. We have some great resources that we want to make available to you. And so if you can follow that link that's provided on the screen, uh, we will show you the next steps that you need to take as you're a follower of Jesus Christ and encourage you in some things. We would love to hear what God has done in your life. We would love to get you a Bible. So I want to encourage you now, take a minute Uh, Follow those instructions and please get in touch with us. May God bless you and your family today. May God bless the United States of America. 